session at the end of our presentation this evening. And we're going to encourage you to forward any questions you may have to Jack in the chat, and he will pull them all together um, so that we can access them at the end. I'm also joined by my colleague, Andrew Cuthbert. Um, Andrew is a planner with our firm as well. He's been working on the OCP review with me the entire time. And um, you'll get to know him quite a bit this evening as he will be presenting quite a bit of material. And then I also have Devin with me. I'm going to turn it over to Devin momentarily. She's our technical wizard who's going to be operating behind the scenes this evening and making sure everything runs smoothly. So I'm going to hand it over to Devin to give us a bit of a technology tutorial just while we let others join and um, before we officially kick off the open house this evening. Perfect, thanks Melissa. Hi everybody. Um, so uh, tonight we're using the Zoom platform um, and in case you're not familiar with it, we'll just do a quick run through. Uh, we do have a few security features today, one of which is that there is a uh, waiting room in the meeting. So um, I will be admitting people as they come in, but if you do leave the meeting, um, you will be able to re-enter to the waiting room and it might just take me a minute to uh, let you in depending on where we are in the presentation. Um, what you see on the screen right now is a snapshot of the participants view in Zoom. Um, the video and audio settings are on the left hand um, if you're using your computer and the order might be reversed if you're on a mobile device. So we invite you to keep your video on for the session. However, if you're experiencing uh, connection problems, uh, you can feel free to turn off the video. Sometimes that might help. Um, we will be muting your microphones throughout the, much of the session to help eliminate any background noise. We ask that if you would like to speak to the entire group that you raise your hand, um, which we'll cover in a second. And one of our hosts will unmute your microphone when there's an opportunity to do so. Um, so how do you raise your hand? You'll notice that there is a participants button on the menu ribbon at the bottom. And when you click on that, you see a little blue hand. You will also see that you can provide a yes or no answer and other feedback as we go. Um, so if you want to give the raise a hand feature a go, uh, if you have found that feature, please click on it now and raise your hand. And we'll see if that is working for you guys. Seeing any hands up? All right, perfect, seeing some hands up. That's great. So it looks like some of you guys have found it. Um, and to lower your hand, you simply click that button again. Um, and then next to the participants feature is the chat function. So if you have comments or questions during the session and you haven't had a chance to verbally offer them, you can also type them into the chat feature. Um, some of the questions may be answered in the chat by our co-hosts, um, but more technical questions may be referred to our presenters um, through Q&A at the end as well. Um, we will have some designated time at the end of the session when you have an opportunity to ask questions, but feel free to include them in the chat as we go along. Um, we will do your, our best to answer your questions, um, but we may be combining some of them together as we, as we see themes coming up um, so that we don't repeat questions. Um, and if time doesn't allow us to get to them all, we will make sure to answer, follow, um, we'll be able to follow up with you, or you can also submit them through a survey that we'll go through at the end, how to access that. Um, so just to make sure that everybody has been able to find the chat feature, um, please feel free to have a note in there. Um, saying hi, and so we can make sure that you are able to access that. And uh, with that, I'll pass that back to Melissa. Hey, wonderful, thank you, Devin. So I'd like to begin our uh, open house this evening by acknowledging the land that we are meeting on. We wish to acknowledge that this meeting is taking place on the unceded territory of the Coast Salish people. Tantme Wheaton, or Belkara, is home to an ancestral village of the Slavic Nation. We are thankful to conduct our work within their territory. So I'd just like to acknowledge all of you participants who are with us this evening. It's wonderful to see so many people out uh, and so involved in their community. So thank you very much for taking the time out of your evening to spend with us tonight. I'd also like to acknowledge that we have a number of uh, municipal officials in attendance this evening. So I'd like to welcome Councillors 
Carolina Clark, Bruce Drake, John Snell, and Lisa Wilder. And also with us this evening is Mayor Jamie Robb. So I'd actually like to welcome Mayor Jamie to say a few opening remarks, please. Uh, thank you very much, Melissa. And good evening. It's my pleasure as mayor to be able to um, say a few opening words and acknowledge the people who are working on our behalf on our official community plan. So I'd like to start off with our committee members. We have Ian Devlin, the chair. We have Ralph Drew, vice chair, Larry Carlson, Paul DeGraff, Joel Drake, Kevin Ferris, Tracy McRae, Marianne Pope, Sandra Rachel, Janet Rizicki, and Angela Yen. I really wanna thank those committee members for their service on behalf of our community in this process. Um, we have with us our um, planning consultants. I'd like to um, thank Melissa Clement, Andrew Cuthbert, and Devin Jennings Lander, and Jack DeSante for their work in helping to organize this open house. And we really appreciate, I've been able to come on at all the meetings and it's just been fascinating to see all the work done. I would be <clears throat> remiss if I did not thank our council lead, Councillor Carolina Clark for the work that she's done to support this committee. Really wanna thank you for that. And I'd also like to uh, recognize our staff for their work. Um, Paula Richardson, who is our acting corporate officer. Thank you for your work. And Dennis Back, who's our acting chief administrative officer who has come in to uh, help while Lorna is away. I wanna thank and recognize you both for all your work. And I'd also like to, I know that they have been recognized, but I'm joined by our, we are joined by our council colleagues. In addition to Councillor Clark, we have Councillor Snell, Councillor Drake and Councillor Lisa Wilder. And I would um, just like to uh, finish off by thanking everybody who's come out tonight um, to participate in the open house. This will ensure that we will uh, continue to have a good process. And I'm looking forward to now just quietly uh, fading into the background and watching the good process unfold. So thank you very much, everyone. Thank you very much, Mayor Ross, for those opening remarks. Now I'd like to introduce or, or hand it over to Councillor Carolina Clark, who is the lead of our OCP Review Committee to say a few words. Thank you very much, Melissa. Well, thank you everybody for being here tonight. It's a, it's a very important night for us. Um, the OCP is a very important document um, that guides all the policies um, that we'll be doing in the future in the municipality. Um, I'd like to really thank everybody that um, has responded to the surveys. Um, and all uh, the, the community engagement that we've been getting. So thank you. And also a very special thank you to all of the committee members, um, Ian Devlin, the chair and, and all and everybody. Um, there's a lot of work that's being done. Um, you know, it's, um, I like to tell everybody that's here tonight that the work doesn't just necessarily just happens in the meetings. There's a lot of assignments that they go home to, um, to bring it back uh, to other meetings. So, uh, so they've been working really hard and we all owe like a huge um, thank you uh, to all of them. So thank you very much. And, um, and yeah, and I'll be sitting on the background here, quiet, um, watching the process unfolding. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you very much, um, Councilor Clark. Um, I'd also like to allow the chair of our OCP Review Committee, Ian Devlin, to say a few words on behalf of the committee. Oh. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to start by acknowledging the various committee members contribution to the development of this new policies that will be included in the final OCP document. Members of the OCP review committee are an enthusiastic bunch, I can tell you, and have demonstrated several areas of specific interest that they wanna see included in the OCP. We've been working as research groups intended to give committee members an opportunity to research and report 
on the topics that they have been assigned. Research groups meet and conducted their research between the monthly uh, meetings and then reported back their findings to the full OCP committee at the next meeting where the topics were discussed. For the past three months, we've engaged in uh, three main areas of discussion. The first uh, month was the assignments were given to the three subgroups. First one was wildfire safety, environmental integrity. The second group had a habitat restoration and invasive species as their assigned topic. The third group talked about climate change and emission reduction strategies. The second month was devoted to transportation, trails, and tourism. The uh, first group was assigned active transportation and trails, including walking, cycling, and recreation. Second group was tourism, promotion and management. And the third group had traffic and parking as their assigned topics. The, this month's assignment was complete communities, housing and waste management. The first group was uh, to research complete communities, including potential permissive commercial use. Second group in, talked about or is researching inclusive approach to housing, which included affordable housing for different life stages. And the third group was waste management and recycling. In addition to these three assigned groups, we took it upon ourselves to talk about two additional topics. One was governance, which we prepared, and we just finished the second one, which is financial sustainability. So that's been the workload for the past three months for your committee. Thanks very much to the committee and for everybody participating. Thank you very much, Ian. Yes, <clears throat> so as you've heard, we've been keeping the OCP committee uh, very busy over the last few months and they've been a tremendous um, source of support and um, very informative and enthusiastic group of people. Okay, well, why don't we begin? So we'll pull up our presentation and we'll start with the agenda. So. This evening, one of the first things we're going to do is we're going to review some ground rules to ensure that we have a very productive uh, session this evening. We want to tell you a little bit about what our objectives are for tonight. So why are we getting together? What is it that we want to share with you? What is it that we want to hear back from you? We're going to um, so we have two presentations this evening. The first one, the first part of the um, presentation, we want to report back on what we heard through that first phase of engagement. So a number of you likely participated in the first open house or completed the community survey. And we want to take some time to let you know what we heard from you, uh, as well as some of your fellow residents. What we've done is we've taken all that input that we heard from you in that first phase, combined it with feedback that we've been receiving for various stakeholders, as well as the OCP review committee. And we took that and we developed a draft vision and a set of strategic goals that will provide the overarching direction for the new OCP. And we want to present those to you this evening and then give you an opportunity through a poll to let us know how we're doing. So we'll be asking you a couple of questions. There'll be a couple of interactive sessions um, so we can get some direct feedback that way. Once we've sort of wrapped up that piece, uh, we're going to then um, make a, a larger presentation that's going to walk you through the draft plan. So we're gonna start at you know, some of the basics. How is the plan structured? How is this plan different from the previous plan? Um, that is currently um, in effect at the moment, and then break it down by various uh, 
policy areas, the key policy areas of the plan. We're going to present to you a number of new maps that have been updated or created from the previous OCP that will be included in the plan and sort of walk you through what those look like. A lot of this evening is going to be us providing you with information. What our intent is, is that once this presentation is over, all the material that we're going to present this evening is going to be posted on the Village webpage. At the same time, there is a link to another survey, we call it a community feedback form, where you're going to get to see in a bit more detail more of the specific policies and have an opportunity through that feedback form to provide your um, thoughts and comments on the draft policies and the draft map and the draft plan in general. So we'll walk you through that um, towards the end of the meeting. At that point, um, those of you who have other commitments, um, we will make some concluding comments. And for those of you that have some extra time, we will have a question and answer session at the end. So if at any time during the presentation this evening, you have a question, I encourage you to use the chat function. Direct your question to um, Jack, so you'll see his name is identified as Q&A. He, he just gave you away. You can send him your questions and he's going to collect them over the course of the evening and we'll use those for the Q&A session at the end. So we anticipate this evening's meeting will take about an hour and a half. Um, we'll do our best to be punctual. Okay, so what are the ground rules? Well, they're really not that many. Uh, the one thing that we do ask though is that we ask that you identify yourself by including your first and last name on your Zoom profile. And we do this because we want to ensure that everyone who has taken the time to participate has an understanding of who is in the room with them. So for those of you who may not know how to do that, if you hover your cursor over the top right-hand corner of your picture, you should see three little dots appear. And if you click on those three little dots, a little drop down menu will appear and there's an option to rename yourself. And that's where you can put in your first and last name. The other thing that we ask is that you also turn your camera on, right? This is a community event and it's always comforting to be able to see other people's faces when you're in a group environment. We ask that you use respectful language when posting questions in the chat and that you focus your comments on the topics being discussed. And above all else, we ask that you have some fun and enjoy the planning process. With that, how about we get started? So objectives for this evening. Well, one, as I mentioned, we want to report back what we heard in the first phase of public engagement. You know, one of the Foundational principles of engagement is if you ask a question, it's always best to let people know what you heard, right? So share with them the answers. So we are going to do that. We want to tell you a little bit about what the planning process is going to be from this point moving forward. We want to consult you on the draft vision and strategic goals. And we want to provide an overview of the new OCP structure and character. At the same time, we want to provide you with an overview of the, the draft land use map and inform you how the policies will be implemented. So for us, implementation is, is critical, right? We, you've heard this evening about the efforts that the OCP Review Committee has put in. You yourself have taken time to participate in engagement activities. And at the end of the day, we want to ensure that the plan that we create is one that's going to be used. We don't want to just have it sit on a shelf, right? So we're going to spend some time at the end talking about how we see these policies being implemented moving forward. We want to inform you how you can provide input into the planning process. 
So Dan will review the feedback form and how you can provide your comments. And then, as I mentioned, at the end, we'll have a Q&A session. So we want to provide you with the opportunity to ask questions of us. So where are we in the planning process? So if you recall, in December, Council um, initiated this planning process and they engaged our firm to help them with that. Now, this is a bit of a tight timeline for an OCP review process, but we're doing our best to meet the village's um, expectations. So we started way back in January where we launched the project. Over the spring, you'll recall, we did quite a bit of community engagement. Um, Andrew and I and our colleagues were busy gathering information from stakeholders, doing our due diligence research. And we spent the last six weeks developing the plan. So crafting the policies, working on the map, um, a lot of the material that you're going to see today and in the um, community survey that you're going to fill out later. So we're at the point where we have a draft plan ready um, that will be distributed to a number of people next week. A copy of that draft plan will be posted on the village webpage, so you'll have an opportunity to look at it very shortly. And then as we move through June and the first part of July, this is where we're going to be reworking the plan to take into account feedback that we receive from yourself, from the review committee, from the different stakeholders that we're consulting, and then also to uh, obtain contributions from Lewis Nation. Nation. So that work will be sort of ongoing throughout June and the first part of July. Now, Council had originally had the objective of wrapping this project up in July, and we're definitely on track to do that. Um, the one unknown, though, is when we receive contributions from Slayless Youth. So we're tracking the right direction, um, but that, that um, the date for feedback is a little bit beyond our control when it comes to getting feedback from Slayless Youth. Staff. So that is where we are. So yeah, now I can. Oh yeah, sorry, I was gonna hand it yeah. over to Andrew. <laughs> Yeah, I'll give a, a quick overview of uh, the stakeholder engagement we've done to date and the community engagement we've done to date. So you can see how what we've heard from, from yourselves and your neighbors and uh, different agencies that we've been talking to uh, to date. So a lot of this information is, this is a consolidated version of information that you might've shared with us last time. And you can see kind of how we're starting to use uh, your feedback. So stakeholders we've we've uh, reached out to and spoken to to date include uh, Metrovan, uh, their planning department, their parks department, the Vancouver Fraser Port Authority, the Chamber of Commerce, uh, TransLink, BC Hydro, the village's own um, public works and engineering uh, staff and consultants, at Sasmat Outdoor Center, the City of Port Moody, and Sasmat Fire Department. We did reach out to Village of Anmore, and they uh, chose not to comment. So, they've uh, that that's their involvement in this process. Um, and we've also had four OCP review committee meetings uh, to date, and Ian gave a really good overview of what we've spoken about in in those. And we've got two more scheduled for June, um, and that's you know to to really get into the draft OCP and start working on, on the policies. As Melissa said, we've reached out to Slay with Tooth Nation, and this is a bit of a, a, a history of our, our, our communication with them to date. So we, we originally reached out uh, government to government uh, through village staff uh, to Chief Jennifer Thomas in February, and we sent follow-up uh, con correspondence in March and had, had an initial uh, meeting with the nation's review team and they gave us an overview of their own process in, in terms of how they deal with referrals they re they receive a lot of referrals they told us upwards of 700 a year so um, basically we have to take a spot in line um, 
And so we're, we're working to deliver them everything they need so that they can begin their process. Uh, our goals for meeting with, with Slay with Tooth and getting their feedback and why it's important is uh, to advance truth and re reconciliation in the Belcara community and to include Slay with Tooth's perspective on Belcara's past, present, and future, and to identify places of cultural and historical significance within the community. It's also an opportunity for the village and the nation to strengthen their, their working relationship on, on other matters going forward beyond the OCP. Now for the uh, community results. So the, this is the survey, and then I'll be talking about the, the last open house. So our first community survey was open from February 21st to March 15th, and we received a total of 111 responses, which is about 17% of the whole community, which is a really great response rate. So people of Belcare are very engaged and that, that's been great to get that feedback. Um, what was also great was to, to see the, the length of tenure that a lot of community members had in Belcara. So 27% of respondents had lived in the, said they'd lived in the community for more than 40 years. And 34% said they'd lived in Belcara for between 20 and 30 years. So we've got a perspective from folks who know the community really well. And that's been, that's been great. We also, uh, you know, this is a breakdown of, of where uh, survey respondents live. And so, you know, most people reported living in Bedwell Bay or Be Belcara Bay would make sense. That's where the most uh, houses are. And then the rest of the respondents kind of evenly, more or less, distributed throughout the rest of the community. Our first question that we had uh, was, what are three words that you would use to describe Belcara today? And we, we've consolidated all that information and made this, this word cloud, uh, you know, this proportional to the number of times people mentioned different words. And so it was, it was very interesting to see, um, you know, peaceful, quiet, beautiful, rural, friendly, all popping out. So, you know, that was, that was really nice to see. Um, you know, there's some other other components too, which we'll touch on. It was like divided came up uh, quite a bit. Uh, stagnant was another word used. Expensive to a lesser extent. So it, it this word cloud gives you a full kind of sense of the complexity that's that making up the community Belcare today, and and things that we need to address in the OCP. Next, we asked, what do you love most about your community? And this was an open-ended question that we've, we've consolidated in answers just to, to, for, for reporting purposes. And the um, thing that people liked most was the, the natural surroundings, followed by rural setting, the sense of community, the peaceful environment, and the access to nature. And uh, below, you can see kind of other descriptors of, of what people meant when they were talking about those, those, those topics. What is one thing you would change about Belcara? This was an interesting one where overwhelmingly it was uh, people reported something to do with governance and policy. So um, that's that's great uh, to, to hear. It's, uh, it's something that we've incorporated. We've made special mention of it and included a good suite of policies that we'll talk about um, later in the document. It's also important to recognize that the OCP in itself is a policy document for land use as well as other, other matters that uh, affect the community. So this is uh, hopefully, you know, it's one, it's an it's a opportunity to provide input on those policies and two, it's a, it's, it's, it's a, direction, a tool that uh, council can use to make decisions going forward. So having your opinions and your, your thoughts incorporated into that gives a, basically a direct line to council on how that's uh, going to work. Uh, other things that people want, said that they wanted to change, there was a, a tie between general infrastructure servicing, community division, active transportation and infrastructure, access to recreation amenities, um, services and events, 
and then uh, traffic, parking, noise, and, and visitor access. In 20 years, uh, people reported largely that Belcaro will, will, will remain the same. Some people thought that Belcaro might be amalgamated. I mean, we don't we don't know exactly what's going to happen in the future, but this is this gives us a you know a sense of how people are feeling about uh, where the community is going. The in general, from this question, we 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 derive it. You know, pe people are just really they value the the rural character and and the, the access to nature in a, in a rural setting. Three emerging priorities uh, is the next question we asked about, and uh, emergency preparedness was was the first one. Obviously, uh, in the fall we had atmospheric rivers, and we're starting to see more and more natural kind of emergencies emerge, which is you know makes it front of mind for many. So we've, we've made sure to to include language on that and policy on that in in the document. Uh, next was infrastructure and servicing financial sustainability, housing, population, active transportation, and then, um, yep, there's the, the full suite. And again, this, this uh, whole presentation will be available tomorrow, so I won't read everything and uh, put everyone to sleep. Next, we asked about uh, specific attributes that make up Belcara's community character and again natural surroundings access to nature and recreation that sense of community so we're starting to see some some themes uh, from from all the respondents and, and folks in the community things that detract from uh, Belcara's community character uh, governance and policy again at the top and you know hopefully through this process we can we can start to address some of those things but um, you know some of those items are beyond the scope of an OCP but this is certainly a, a, an opportunity to begin to to work on some of those those concerns that people mentioned to us in the in the survey uh, traffic parking uh, and pollution next you know they're, they're there's a lot of me uh, Metro Vancouver regional parks in Belcara, and we, we fully understand uh, you know, the impact that residents feel from the influx of visitors, especially since COVID, more people are going outside, more people are visiting parks. And so you're seeing more people in your neighborhood. Um, we'll, we'll touch more on that later in, in the presentation where we, we can talk more about the, the actual policies. Um, Infrastructure and servicing again popping up. Next, uh, I'll touch on the, the virtual open house that was held uh, March 10th, from six to eight. We had 51 people log in to, to chat with us, which was great. Um, we had counselors, committee members, members of staff, community residents. So we've got a good cross section of people from the community providing different perspectives on, on matters related to the OCP. Uh, that present that uh, open house was began quite similarly with an overview of the planning process and, and a walkthrough of the existing OCP. And it was followed by a small breakout room discussions where um, participants you know, got to talk about the three questions we've listed here, which are, when you think about Belcare 20 years from now, what is your ideal community look like? What needs to change about Belcare today for your ideal to become reality and why? And what are the emerging priorities that the OCP should address? And so this was, uh, you know, some of these questions were very similar to ones that were in the survey, but it gave participants an opportunity to speak uh, with us and, and speak about these questions, you know, with their neighbors and, and with, with us uh, basically to, to, to tease out, to go into more detail about those, those concerns. So uh, some key takeaways from each of those questions, and again, this will be available on the village website tomorrow to, to read through in its uh, fullness. Um, when you think about Belcare 20 years from now, what does your ideal community look like? And uh, we've consolidated the conversations. We had uh, several breakout rooms with you know, uh, between five and kind of eight people each. And uh, we these are the the topics we touched on. So housing and affordability, infrastructure, servicing, emergency preparedness, uh, diverse and equitable community, 
uh, recreation and commercial investments, active transportation, uh, protected environment and climate change action, um, the rural character of the community and financial sustainability. These were all, you know, key topics that were that we came up again and again that we, we chatted through uh, during that session. So some some key key things here, you know, related to housing and affordability. Um, it was mentioned already, you know, looking into housing for different income levels, demographic needs, uh, also life stages uh, for infrastructure is, is looking at, uh, you know, improved community access or, you know, questions about the water supply. For active transportation, it was questions about, uh, you know, an improved trail network or improved pedestrian or cycling safety. And then Again, there is, there is a, there's also been a, a strong undercurrent or, or you know, theme of um, environmental protection and you know, environmental stewardship and, and doing right by the environment related to climate change throughout this whole process too. So you know, making sure that the questions about Belcara being a, uh, a carbon neutral community and making sure that any development is, is environmentally sensitive. When asked about uh, what needs to change in Belcare today for your, your vision to become reality and why, uh, you know, areas of change, just go through those quickly as uh, subdivision and housing options. So those two are very closely tied. The number of houses um, is dictated by how closely you can subdivide and what's allowed on, on those parcels, uh, which is again tied to servicing and infrastructure. So um, conversation about that. Again, environmental, environmental management and climate change preparedness. So that ties back to emergency preparedness and, and making sure that uh, Belcare is ready for, for anything that comes in future. Local transportation and community access. So that can be pedestrian safety uh, or, or access to different parts of the community and is also related to uh, emergency preparedness in terms of evacuation routes and, and things like that. Community amenities, services, and recreation. So uh, access to the waterfront is big. This is why a lot of people live here. And so people, people like to go down to the waterfront um, and community facilities. Like we heard, we talked a lot about the, the multi-support court and um, the potential role that they can play in future. Next is governance, uh, citizen involvement, community building. So this was talking about the, the opportunities for community engagement um, and, and starting to talk about some, some of the big questions in the community and, and what are the mechanisms for that. Financial sustainability, so exploring alternatives for revenue generation and, and you know, service delivery. Cross-jurisdictional collaboration is another big one. So that goes back to you know why we're reaching out to stakeholders and and what future uh, what what's possible given if there's uh, the possibility for for future partnerships with some of Belcare's neighbors or other agencies, uh, including say with Tooth First Nation. And then talking more about the community character, uh, protecting that character and maintaining that that small town atmosphere and uh, infrastructure and servicing. So that's mostly related to the, the water supply um, and, and waste. The third uh, question we went through uh, at the open house was, what are the emerging priorities in the OCP? What are the emerging priorities? What emerging priorities should the OCP address and why? And again, um, you know, common themes coming up here throughout all three. And so we'll, we'll touch on these again. So emerging priorities for many are that infrastructure and servicing piece, emergency preparedness, community building, engagement, financial sustainability, active transportation, subdivision and housing options, commercial opportunities, waterfront access, cross-jurisdictional collaboration and environmental management and climate action. So that's what we heard so far uh, and it's been it's been great and we thank everyone for 
for all of your participation in, in the meetings, but also uh, in, in your careful review of the documents that have been available on the website and your responses to the survey. Um, so now I'll hand it back to Melissa to introduce you to some of the, the draft policy, vision, and, and strategic goals that we've developed based on that feedback. Thank you, Andrew. I think the one thing I'd just like to add in terms of the engagement and what we heard, at the end of this planning process, we have prepared um, a what we heard report. So we prepared an interim what we heard report based on the first phase of engagement. And we will add to that report with what we hear through the second phase of engagement. And that document will be a public document that will be posted on the village webpage and will be presented to council. And so you as a uh, community resident will have an opportunity to read the entire what we heard report and in a bit more detail hear some of the specific feedback we received from, from yourself, from your neighbors on um, the draft plan. Okay, so what did we do with everything that you shared with us? It was uh, a lot of really wonderful material. Well, we took that back and we worked on drafting a new vision for, for your community. And this is what we came up with. So our draft vision statement is, Belcara is a peaceful village between the forest and the sea. In 2040, Belcara will be a safe, sustainable, and welcoming community surrounded by natural beauty. So I'll give you a moment just to read that over against yourself. And then I'm going to hand it over to Devin, who's going to walk us through a poll where you'll have an opportunity to provide some feedback on how you feel about this draft statement. Okay, Devin, I think you can bring up the slide pool now. There we go. All right, so we're going to do a quick Slido. Uh, you can either scan the QR code or go to slido.com um, and enter in this code, uh, the 982382. And we have our first poll question here. Uh, so to what extent do you agree or disagree with the draft vision? We'll give you a few moments to go over to slido.com or to scan a QR code with your phone and then enter in your comments. So while you're doing that, I will just read it out for you one more time. So Belcara is a peaceful village between the forest and the sea. In 2040, Belcara will be a safe, sustainable, and welcoming community surrounded by natural beauty. So to what extent do you agree or disagree with the draft vision? We'll give everyone just a few moments to enter in their vote. I just want to remind you that on the community feedback form that you're going to look at, there is an option at the bottom of the form where you can provide feedback on, on the vision, the uh, strategic goals, the policies, the maps, anything that you want to provide comments on. Um, we welcome that feedback in that in that forum. All right, so it's like we're hovering around eleven. Okay. 
At this point, it looks like we've had 12 people provide feedback. And at this point, 42% of the 12 that have commented agree with the draft vision, 33% strongly agree, 17% strongly disagree, and 8% disagree. So again, those of you who have indicated that you strongly disagree or disagree, um, certainly would love to hear the reasons for that in the community feedback form. Wonderful. Okay, thank you, Devin. So we'll pull this down. And what we'll do next is present to you the strategic goals that we've come up with for the OCP. So we've come up with 10 strategic goals. Again, um, the draft strategic goals are first, to be a steward of the natural environment, two, to be prepared for emergencies, three, to meet or exceed the regional greenhouse gas reduction target, four, to be a safe place for residents and visitors to explore, five, to be a village that offers a range of housing options, Number six, to be a municipality that evolves progressively and sustainably. Seven, to be a community where residents feel engaged, informed, and heard. Eight, to be a connected neighbor with strong intergovernmental relationships. Nine, to advance truth and reconciliation in the Belterra community. And 10, to monitor and report on progress being made on the official community plan annually. So again, I'm just going to pass it over to Devin, who's going to bring up another poll for us. And you'll have an opportunity to indicate to what extent you agree or disagree with the, stress, with the draft strategic goals that we presented. Uh, just launching poll number two here. So again, you can scan the QR code or go through slido.com with the code on the screen there. So we have a couple responses so far. Okay, so let's just give it another minute for people to put in their, their comments. So it looks like based on 16 um, participants who provided feedback that that 56% of you either strongly agree or agree with the draft strategic goals, and 44% of you disagree with them. So again, uh, particularly for those who disagree, if you could provide some additional feedback through the comment form, we'd love to hear the reasons um, for, for your voting. So thank you everyone for participating in, in um, those two quick polls. And uh, we'll continue on with our presentation. Okay, so the draft OCP uh, is going to not only look quite a bit different than the existing plan that you have now, um, but there are going to be um, a number of very important changes that we are proposing to be made. So the first 
um, you'll notice when you look at it, when it's posted next week, is that the new plan will incorporate Play With His Voice and identify places of cultural and historical significance. So as I mentioned, right now we're currently waiting for feedback from Play With You. Um, so what you'll see in the draft plan right now, in a couple of areas, there are placeholders for us to include their story as it's told by them. Um, there will be places where we're hoping to identify places that are significant to their community. But also throughout the plan, there are policies that have sprinkled throughout all the various um, areas that speak to relationship building, um, reconciliation with the Slavitude Nation. This is something that is completely absent in the existing plan and um, a component that we thought was incredibly important to include in the new OCP. You're going to see much stronger links to regional planning, transportation and transit planning initiatives. So in a number of areas, we are um, proposing policies that not only speak to what can be done in Belka, but what can be done with uh, neighboring jurisdictions, what can be done um, by working and collaborating with Metro Vancouver, uh, TransLink, et cetera. There's also a greater emphasis on communication, collaboration, and reconciliation. And this is a large part um, due to what we heard through the first phase of engagement. So we really included uh, a brief full from student policies that speak to you know, how the village can communicate with residents, with its neighbors, uh, with Slayer Nation, et cetera. One of the things we're doing is we're introducing a new commercial land use designation, which is different from the existing plan um, that doesn't contemplate any commercial development. And again, this is being introduced in response to what we heard from residents through the first phase of engagement. Um, we heard quite loudly that uh, residents are interested in having some form of commercial development in the community so that they're not dependent on getting into the car um, for their basic necessities. Um, we've also included all new mapping. So this mapping is uh, based on the latest GS data that we have, not only from uh, municipality, from Metro Vancouver, as well as local um, utility providers as well. We've included a very robust implementation policy framework. So this is, uh, you'll see when you look at the plan, it's, it's the last chapter of the plan. And again, this is to ensure that we can make the most out of the effort that is put into this, right? We wanna make sure that your plan is working for you and that you're making progress on it. So we've outlined a series of policies that will help ensure that on an annual basis, progress is being monitored and reported back. A lot of the policies that we've included um, used acronym SMART. We wanted to make sure that they were quite specific uh, measurable where possible. Um, and so I'm hoping that as you go through it, you'll see the difference. We, it's much more action oriented than the existing plan is right now. And just in terms of the like, full look and feel of it, um, the existing plan, you know, doesn't have any photos in it. Um, so what we've done is, you know, there was quite a bit of photographs, infographics, um, and then we have a couple of examples on the, the next page, next couple of slides here, but really trying to use images to help convey messages, to make the plan more accessible to the community. So instead of just having pages and pages of text, you'll see throughout we'll be interspersing uh, infographics like the one that's up on the screen to help tell our story. And again, uh, as we're proposing, making proposals, um, this is an example of, you know, how we can use images to um, help us convey, um, you know, the proposed form of commercial development that the policies are supportive of in the plan. The next couple of slides are just examples of 
the mapping that you'll see in the plan. So again, this is all based on the latest aerial uh, photography that's available for the community. Uh, this first plan just very simply identifies the municipal boundary. The next slide is a recent aerial photograph of the community. I want to make sure that, that our maps are very clear and help us tell the story. So this map, for example, we want to make sure that we identify where our neighboring uh, municipalities are, where the boundary between the different jurisdictions is. We do have quite a few policies that we're proposing that speak to how Belcara can relate and communicate with its neighbors. So the city of Port Moody, the village of Anmore, um, DC parks, provincial government. And, and so using maps as a way of, of, of telling that story as well. So you'll see a number of new maps that look similar to this in the plan. So the plan itself is broken up into eight key policy areas. The first uh, is natural environment, the second being hazard lands, the third climate change, mobility, municipal infrastructure, land use designation, communication, collaboration and reconciliation, and implementation. So just to give you an idea, when you're looking at the uh, plan next week when it's posted, some of the topics that we've covered under natural environment, for example, there are eight subcategories, uh, little families of policy that speak to the topics on, this, on the screen in front of you. So when we are talking about a key policy area, such as natural environment, sort of under that umbrella, there are also policies related to areas that are under the jurisdiction of the Vancouver Freezer Port Authority, uh, policies that speak to Metro Vancouver's designation of regional conservation and recreation areas. There are lands that have been identified by Metro Vancouver as being environmentally sensitive areas. So there's a whole suite of policies that will speak to their protection. We have policies that speak to the tree canopy, invasive species management, wildfire management, water quality, and air quality. So the next slide is just an example of sort of what this looks like. So for example, under the key policy area of national environment, you'll see when you look at the plan, um, the sub topic of regional conservation and recreation areas. And so what we've done is under each of these subheadings, We've provided you with a bit of context. And most times it's, you know, six, seven, eight lines. It's, it's enough that it enables you to have a foundation to understand where those policies are coming from, but not too much information that it makes the plan unmanageable and unreadable, right? We wanted to ensure that we um, put forward a plan that was very concise, um, easy to reference, something that you're going to use and refer to regularly, right? We find that, um, you know, the shorter plans are more difficult to write because they need to be more, um, more focused. We don't want, to, we didn't want to write you um, a hundred page or 150 page OCP that no one's ever going to look at, right? So there'll be a bit of a preamble that will then lead into the policies that we're proposing. So when you look at the uh, feedback uh, form, either this evening or tomorrow, or when you have a moment, what you'll see is um, we've selected a number of policy areas that we're presenting, similar to what you see on screen. And then we'll ask you some questions where you'll be able to sort of weigh in how you feel about what's being proposed. An example here of a figure that's going to be included in the in the plan. And again, 
All of these maps are going to be available on the website for you to look at. Um, but again, using maps to tell the story. So this one here identifies what Metro Vancouver has identified as environmentally sensitive areas. So when you're looking at the policies that speak to environmentally sensitive areas, you can refer to the map and see exactly what lands those apply to. And this map has also identified um, areas that the Vancouver Fraser Port Authority has seen to be important environmental areas. So again, there's a suite of policies in the plan that speaks specifically to them. And then this map will enable you to see exactly what lands those policies relate to. This map here is one that includes Metro Vancouver's land use designation. And this is really important because we see in Belcara that you know, over 70% of the lands are designated by Metro Vancouver as being conservation or recreation lands. And so we wanted to again, um, make it easy for, for you as residents to understand which policies are, which lands the conservation and recreation policies um, relate to. With that, maybe um, Andrew, you can speak a little bit about policies that we have that relate to habit lands. Absolutely. Yeah, and so you know, through through the engagement, we heard that you know, people are really uh, interested, concerned, uh, you know, about emergency response planning. So the plan includes uh, you know a new section on emergency response planning, and that is is related to you know evacuations. It includes interjurisdictional collaboration and, and work with the, the existing fire department. Hazard lands also include steep slopes, so there's new policies in there about uh, about development and what can be built and what measures need to be in place when building on steep slopes, and that's generally defined as slopes greater than 30%, and that's that's uh, you know the common measure um, you know related to uh, subsidence, drainage issues, that sort of thing. So we've got new policies commenting on on that. Um, flood and sea level rise hazards are, are also included, and you know some of these policies were you know they were important the last time the OCP was was reviewed, and they they remain important. So so they those policies remain, and wildfire management also critical. Uh, you know given given climate change and uh, you know our, our hotter summers, though we haven't seen that quite yet, but uh, we're assured that it's coming. But uh, you know, ensuring that new development is is adheres to fire smart policies and and things like that. Melissa, back to you for climate change. Sure. Uh, we have a special plan that's devoted entirely to climate change, uh, and this sort of falls into two two areas. One, climate action planning. So we know that. Um, Belcaris is signatory to the BC Climate Action Charter. And we're looking for ways to uphold that commitment that we've made, the community has made. And so the first set of policies with regard to climate action planning speak to developing a, a climate action plan for the community, right? That would not only support but inform decision making and then you know reduce the long-term costs associated with climate change. Following on that, um, there's also a, a very extensive suite of policies related to greenhouse gas reductions. And these, we've sort of divided them into four different areas. So there's a family of policies that speak to ways in which um, making improvements to buildings can help the community reduce greenhouse gas reductions. So we're looking at things like you know, reviewing Belcare's BC um, energy step codes, you know, every two years um, to see whether or not, you know, the community can make advances there. Uh, there are policies that speak to uh, encouraging the recycling of waste materials. 
uh, through renovations, policies that seek to uh, supporting private homeowner green energy transitions, um, et cetera. There are policies that also speak to how the community can achieve efficiencies with regard to vehicle energy. Um, <clears throat> Here we see uh, policies that not only relate to expanding the active transportation network, um, particularly to ensure that it is the most convenient option for residents making short trips within the community. We also uh, have included policies that speak to Belcara advocating for secure bike parking and electric charging stations in Metro Vancouver Park. So there's, there's quite a, a variety of, of ways that uh, we're proposing efficiencies can be made there. There's a family of policies that speak to low carbon energy sources um, as well. Um, so again, policies that speak to encouraging the development of low impact alternative renewable energy sources such as heat pumps and solar panels. Then we have this category that we've just called other greenhouse gas reduction initiatives because um, you know great ideas didn't necessarily fall into the first three categories, but we're looking at things like um, and, and you know this is where community can get involved, adopt appointing a climate action task force, um, residents that can do research on you know municipal incentive programs for encouraging fuel switching or adopting efficient energy practices, uh, putting forward proposals that speak to pu um, publishing materials for public education purposes, ways in which the municipality can be a leader in um, greenhouse gas reduction. So there's, there's um, quite a variety of policies all aimed towards reducing those numbers. And I think the one thing that I'd like to emphasize, and, and one thing that we've, we've done, not just within climate change, but within all the different policy areas, is you know, identify not only things that the municipality can do, um, but also things that community members can also take on, right? We recognize that the municipality is small, and very limited staffing resources available, funding resources available, but there are a lot of um, small things that community residents can also contribute. So you'll see policies that, can, that speak, to, speak to things like that as well. So with that, Angela, I'll pass back to you to talk about um, the mobility policies we have. Thanks. Yeah, so more on the uh, relate related to the, the greenhouse gas uh, question, active transportation and trials, uh, you know, feature heavily under mobility. But uh, you know that's not ignoring the importance of the road network, uh, the parking issues in, in transit, but also water access because we know that there's many properties within Belcara that that don't have road access, and and so that's that's a important and unique part of Belcara as well. So related to active transportation and trails, uh, you know this family of policies talks about just the you know. What we heard from residents is, is people want a, a more interconnected trail network. People are interested in, in the idea of active transportation. They're interested in making it safer to walk and, and to cycle through the community. And so one of the, the, the ways that you can do that is through the creation of you know, future plans um, and, and, and studies to, to figure out how, what that looks like. You know, We know that Belcara has limited rights of way in terms of roads and, and some complications related to ditching and, and other infrastructure. So th those questions really need uh, some more some more detail added to them. But at this policy level, we can we can direct basically that uh, the council can use this as a tool to to pursue funding for those types of studies. And uh, yeah, so that's related to active transportation. On the trail side, it's it's again about the interjurisdictional collaboration with like Metro Van Parks and making sure that the trail network and any connections in the village uh, function well 
and are, are open and clear. From the road network and parking standpoint, you know that that again is largely related to interjurisdictional collaboration because of uh, you know the influx of visitors, uh, you know, causing issues with with the road network and and the parking situation. We know the village has done a a, a parking study just just recently to kind of further get into that and um, that will be uh, influencing this work as well. And transit, um, it's again, keeping the door open with TransLink and making sure that, uh, that, that one, there's good lines of communication, but also, you know, open conversation about in like seasonal bus service or opportunities to, to give people other options other than driving to visit parks. So uh, this is the, the kind of existing conditions um, mobility map for Belcara. You know, it, most of the roads are they're they're just local roads. Um, there's the one transit line coming through the community, but uh, we've and we've got the bus stops on here. But this is this is the uh, the, the base that uh, the community is working with, and then. Related to that, uh, the trail network, and you can see, you know, faintly the the trails on on the uh, in Metro Van Parks, and where there might be opportunities to to connect better to those networks from from municipal uh, um, infrastructure. And related to that, uh, we also have a, a suite of policies related to municipal infrastructure. So the OCP has to comment on future servicing needs for the community. And this is where we, we do that. So a lot of these policies, again, um, they're, they're action-oriented policies, but they're, they're, they're things that were important the last time the OCP was created, and they're things that continue to be important now. Uh, we've, we've through conversations with with the village's own staff and, and you know different different service providers, we've we've added to these. Um, and key highlights from these are the the asset management and the infrastructure planning portion right up at the front. And so this is really tied back to the financial sustainability question that a lot of people brought up in the first round of engagement. And so asset management is about understanding what infrastructure the village owns and what its service life is and how it's functioning and making a plan for its maintenance and replacement. And so that's a new part of the of the OCP which is which is pretty exciting because it uh, it speaks to that you know taking care of what you already have and, and making making sure that you've taken care of that first before uh, planning for new. And so that that's pretty critical. Uh, the water systems also come up in, in conversations with the through, through the phase one engagement and, and some of our conversations with the community and that's you know that's also important so monitoring uh, you know demand of that on that system and, and making sure that it's functioning well uh, is also of critical importance from a stormwater perspective uh, you know there, there's there's the opportunity just to make sure that uh, the drainage is working well in the community and you know we've heard a lot about ditching and uh, and just drainage in general like Alcara is you know in a rainforest it gets wet in the winter it, there, it's steep slopes there's there's drainage issues and, and so making sure that that's functioning well is really important uh, liquid waste so this is really related to septic so we've got some policies there and these are heavily driven by um, direction from, from the local health authority. And there's also more, more um, policies related to solid waste, recycling, and, and some direction on unserviced properties as well. So here's a map of the, of the, the water infrastructure as it is today. So you can see where the water lines are, where the hydrants are, and uh, where the water main comes, uh, you know, that connection from the District of North Vancouver. Uh, also important to highlight community facilities. So these would also fall under an asset management program. And, you know, specifically there is like 
the, the Belcara Municipal Hall is an asset that the village owns and needs to take care of and, and is, a, is a community resource. As are, I believe, the, uh, the Waste and Recycling Depot. And uh, I think, I believe the, the Volunteer Fire Department makes a little bit differently, but uh, this is you know, the community facilities in Belcara. Next, we have our, our land use designations. So this is what we've just gone through are the, the policies that you kind of reach over all of aspects of Belcara. The land use designations are policies related to specific areas on a map. So we've mapped the, the community and uh, given each area you know, a, a land use designation and there's policies that go with that. And so the land use designations that uh, that are in the new OCP are residential, commercial, conservation and recreation, civic institutional, civic marine, and natural title. And given what we've heard from, from the community, the community stakeholders, there's actually not a lot of change in many of these designations from the previous uh, OCP. Uh, natural tidal areas, you know, they're, they're also governed by, by the Port Authority, and there's interest from Slave Tooth Nation on those. So they, they, they remain uh, protected areas. Civic Marine, we, we've heard some about, you know, that's the access to the waterfront that was featured heavily in the, the Bedwell Bay Sustainability Plan that was part of the last OCP as well. Then the civic institutional basically covers the village hall and the recycling center and an assessment, uh, a fire department, volunteer fire department. Uh, the top three are where we've made the, the done the most work. And so in the in the residential component, we've we've gone in and uh, basically just made sure that there's a, a good range of housing options. Uh, which tweaked things a little bit uh, to, but made sure that it also reflects, uh, you know, the real, the realities of the servicing situation in Belcara. And the reality is that there's a lot of development is, is limited by what services are available. And as many of the properties or mo all properties are on septic, that really limits how many units can be in the village. At some point in the future, should there be a sanitary line uh, connection to Belcare, that could change, but uh, that uh, does not appear to be on the immediate horizon. The commercial designation is new, and it's it's an interesting one because it does not have a place on the map, but it's a land use designation that can be used um, if somebody applies for an amendment to the OCP. So if somebody wants to redesignate their property, there's a process that they can go through with the village to apply for that redesignation. And that again would, would kick off a, a new process with council and there would be a decision and a dis discussion about that. But the nature of commercial uh, and why we included it was that uh, in our first round of engagement, a lot of participants uh, expressed the interest in, in the idea of a local coffee shop, um, or a small boutique kind of grocery store, like the one that was pictured earlier in the presentation. And so the scale and scope of commercial is really limited to, to that scale of development. And you know, it's not intended to be used for things like, like anything larger than that. Um, there's, there's policies in, in the commercial designation that I believe are tied to the number of employees, just, just to keep the to reiterate that the scale is small and, and neighborhood and, and focused on, on local uh, amenities. The conservation and recreation designation uh, basically applies to Metro Van parks and provincial parks in, in the community. Uh, the previous plan also ha had designated an area for watershed, which we've included in this. And so here is our land use designation map. Um, Melissa, did you have anything that you wanted to, to add or, or comment on related to our 
my new size designations. I think the one thing that I will add is that um, when you look at the community survey, the full suite of policies for the proposed commercial land use designation are presented. So you'll see them in their entirety, and then you can weigh in on how you feel about them. There's also an opportunity to uh, not only indicate your level of agreement, but also to provide us with an idea of how close we got, you know, how, how ambitious are the policies. So for example, um, if you feel that the proposed commercial uses are not ambitious enough, there's an opportunity to indicate that. If you feel that they are too ambitious, there's an opportunity to indicate that as well. So I um, encourage you to have a look at that. The other item that we heard a lot about in the first phase of engagement was the idea of like communication um, with residents, between residents, uh, the community division, and, and governance. And, and so we've included this suite of policies called communication, collaboration, and reconciliation. And this is broken it out into three key areas uh, that are all pretty essential goals going forward. And again, these aren't these aren't land use designations, but these help uh, council make decisions based on land use matters, essentially, and to guide that. So the first being relationship to slave tooth nation so this is a, a strategic goal that was highlighted and, and highlighted that as important by the committee by by staff by many people in the phase one engagement and this is about strengthening the village's um, relationship with slave tooth nation working towards reconciliation and identifying you know future projects for for collaboration and where where the village and the nation can can identify shared goals and, and work towards those goals. Next, we have relationships between neighboring jurisdictions and government agencies. And we talked a lot about this, but this is, you know, specifically keeping the door open and maintaining lines of communication with uh, neighboring jurisdictions and agencies on to, to make sure that the Belcara can have a say and, and open conversations with uh, agencies like TransLink on bus service, uh, with Metro Parks on things like, well, the parks and, and the parking impacts specifically, uh, amongst other things. Also, you know, partnering with, with neighbors like, like Ann Moore or Port Moody uh, to, to figure out where there's, where there's shared goals or interests, um, where, there, where there might be, um, you know, confusion in terms of like a emergency response or, or something like that, you know, making sure that there's lines of communication so that uh, those types of issues can be can be sorted out efficiently. And the last, uh, and definitely not least is the relationship with the Belcara community. And these policies are about, you know, civic engagement and making sure that there's there's opportunity to comment on policies like the OCP, like amendments to the OCP, um, and, and ensuring that there's ample, ample time to do that and, and ample notice that uh, that different events or or opportunities for comment are are coming. So that's a, that's a critical one as well. So how does this all work? Uh, Melissa's going to tell you. <laughs> so as I mentioned earlier in the evening, we really want um, your OCP to be a living and working document. And by living, I mean something that is constantly evolving, right? Your community is constantly changing. You're continuously faced with um, new pressures, new opportunities. And we want to ensure that those are being taken into consideration. We want it to be a working document. So we don't want to put this effort in, have you put the effort in to create a document that's just going to sit on your shelf. We want this to be something that you know, is on the table at council meetings when land use planning decisions are being contemplated. 
Um, this is something that residents will talk about, will be familiar with, um, something that is, is, is quite usable. So for us, um, you know, we, we advocate really hard for municipalities to learn from their implementation successes and failures. Quite often what happens with OCPs is that there's all this momentum is built, a lot of public input is put into creating them, and we celebrate this plan that's adopted by council. And then we don't hear about it again for five years when we do the five-year review, or longer in some cases, right? And we want to ensure that that doesn't happen. So what we've done is we've implemented or we're proposing a series of policies that would um, set the framework for this continuous cycle. Continuous cycle of monitoring, evaluating, adjusting, and reporting. And we'd like this to occur on an annual basis, right? So every year you would go through, you would watch to see, um, um, you know, what, what, what's happening, you would evaluate it against a set of criteria. You know, perhaps you may adjust your plan, um, you know, perhaps policies, perhaps measures that are going to be used to, to evaluate, and then you report back. I'll talk a little bit about each of those in a bit more detail in a second. That what we envision for you is that sort of this annual um, cycle would occur um, in tangent with your strategic planning and budgeting processes. So that when council in the fall is looking at the budget and you know, establishing priorities and putting that forward, at the same time, they're looking at your OCP and they're saying, oh, that's right. You know, we identified this as a key priority. Um, this is a project that was identified in the plan. Can we incorporate that into the budget somehow? Um, and also not just only the budgeting process, but also the strategic planning process. So as Andrew mentioned, one thing that we heard quite a bit from, from your community is there are a number of issues, or there are a number of concerns with regard to decision making, uh, community engagement, notification. And we've addressed some of that um, in this plan. But again, we have to remember that this is a land use document. And so there are opportunities to further that and to um, complement that work through strategic planning processes that occur on an annual basis as well. We kind of like to see these three things kind of like kind of um, evolving over the course of the year together, working hand in hand, being very complementary. So we have policies that we're proposing that would have council adopt an annual progress report that would be published um, to the community. And you know, this is something that we're seeing happening across municipalities across Canada, around the world. You know, Melbourne is certainly a leader when it comes to implementation. So what this would look like, if we just flip to the next slide, you will constantly be monitoring your OCP, right? And what we suggest is that you develop an actual evaluation program. So, what, what we would do and what we envision and what we will include in the OCP is an actual matrix. And, and perhaps, Andrew, we can just skip ahead just a little bit. Um, yeah. So at the end of the OCP, there's going to be a matrix that is going to be a table that identifies every OCP policy. And with those policies, we're going to identify whether or not it's a low, medium or high priority. And again, this is based on feedback that we receive from the community, stakeholders, administration, et cetera. What is the timeline for, again, achieving or completing that action? That something is going to happen in the short term, sort of medium term, something that may be longer than uh, a council cycle? Or is it something that's ongoing? You want to identify whose responsibility it is? 
and whether or not there's a partner agency that may be required to move this initiative forward, right? So if it's a policy that speaks to regional parks, for example, you know, it may be the joint responsibility of Belterra and Metro. Um, it's certainly important to identify that Metro would be the partner in this. Where is the money going to come from, right? Is this something that can be accommodated through the municipal budget? Are there alternative funding sources that may be obtained to help move some of these initiatives forward? Those would be identified. And as we develop, or as the municipality develops that sort of monitoring program, what we would like to see happen is that for each of those policies, where possible, if there's a measurable uh, indicator that we can use, you know, maybe say greenhouse gas emissions, for example, you know, if there's a specific target that we're aiming to hit, we can track that over time. If it, we want to um, develop a more diverse housing stock, that we can track by, you know, the number of new building permits that are issued each year for various types of housing forms. So that information that's already being collected by the municipality can be used to actually track the progress that's being made on the plan. <clears throat> now, Angel, I'll have you back up a couple of slides. And so as we monitor, the next thing that we're going to do is we're going to start evaluating. So we're going to start looking at those metrics. And <clears throat> in areas where you know, we may not have something that is specifically measurable. And, and Andrea can move to the next slide. There may be opportunities to have um, what we could, you know, for lack of a better word, performance trackers. These are the things where they're more, um, you know, qualitative. How do people feel about the community? Do they feel safe in their community? How do we, there's no measure for that specifically. But we can, through engagement, see how people feel. And we can monitor um, how those are trending over time. So we could go through this process of evaluating them. And then if we find throughout you know, the process that say over the first year, second year, there are certain initiatives that just are not moving forward. Well, why don't we change them, right? So maybe it's you know, maybe the policy isn't working well and needs to be amended somehow. Maybe the metric that we're using to measure progress isn't appropriate. And maybe we should be, you know, collecting data on something else. Um, I, I want municipalities that I work with to not be afraid of amending their OCP, right? This, your community is going to change over time and the policies are going to need to change with them. So say, for example, we have a policy that speaks to developing a climate action plan. Well, once that's done, there's no need to have that policy in your plan anymore. You may want to have other policies that speak to how you're going to implement that plan. And so I guess what I'm saying is that over this annual sort of, you know, monitoring, evaluating, reviewing process, you could um, make those adjustments at the end of every year or every two years. You don't have to wait for that five-year review cycle. And so we're putting forward policies that would enable you to do that. And then of course, with anything, we wanna see um, all of this reported out. So if we're going to do this on an annual basis, you know, um, a lot of municipalities are now putting together very quick reports, right? Here's the progress we made this year. Um, you know, here are some areas where maybe we didn't make any progress and this is why. Um, so reporting to ensure that there's transparency, you know, accountability, uh, not just municipality, because remember I said that there are a number of policies that also speak to ways in which community residents can get involved in move initiatives forward. Um, but also for community engagement purposes, right? So as we publish this information, uh, public can read it, take it in, and then have an opportunity to share their thoughts with council. So that is how we're proposing to implement this plan.
yeah, and again, um, you know, traditionally, um, you know, a lot of municipalities will review their their OCPs on that five year sort of cycle in line with when their housing needs reports are updated. But um, again, you know, as new opportunities come up or unforeseen events take place, um, you know, just having a look at it on a yearly basis will enable you to be a bit more nimble and a lot more effective in implementing your plan. So um, just before we start our Q&A, we just want to give you an idea of kind of what's up next. So as I mentioned, um, the presentation that we gave this evening, as well as the draft map, are posted on the Village webpage for you to review. Um, there's also a link on the webpage to the community feedback form. And so that's uh, a place where you're going to see the opportunity to provide feedback on the draft vision, strategic goals, and as well as select policies. So, you know, we didn't want to inundate you with every policy that's been put forward in the plan. So what we've done is we've selected families of policies largely based on the priorities that were identified by the community in the first uh, round of engagement for you to provide feedback on. So I think in total, we have about 80 policies for you to have a look at. Uh, you'll have an opportunity to indicate to what degree you, to what degree do you agree or disagree with the draft policies? And to what degree do you think the policies are ambitious enough? You know, so are we being a little bit too ambitious? So we got it just right, or you know, maybe we could push things a little bit further. And then as I mentioned, at the end of that feedback form, there's an opportunity for you to provide open-ended comments um, with regard to anything that you see in the presentation or the plan in general. So that feedback form, um, and just want to confirm with Paula, I believe has been posted. The materials have been posted. Great. Um, and that's going to be available until uh, Wednesday, June 1st. And it will uh, be available until midnight that day. So uh, what we're going to be doing um, next week, we have another session with the OCP Review Committee on June 1st. We are going to present the draft OCP document in its entirety to them. That draft document is going to be circulated to stakeholders on June 3rd. It will also be referred to Slayo Signation and posted on the village webpage for you to have a look at. We will be then analyzing the results from the community feedback form. Um, we'll do that as soon as um, the, the, the deadline to comment has, has ended. And that's kind of like where we enter that tweaking phase. So we're going to look at your feedback. We will be circulating the plan to the various stakeholders that we've met with and getting their feedback on it as well. And um, also feedback from the review committee. So there'll be a bit of tweaking that will go on to, I'm sure, probably a number of the policies. And we will revise the draft as required. And then, as I mentioned, uh, once we receive you know, contributions from Slaywood Tooth, then we will incorporate them into the plan. So that is what uh, our next steps look like. So at this point, and I'm just cognizant of the fact that we've gone over time, um, I just want to thank everyone for coming out this evening and sharing, um, sharing the comments and the draft vision and strategic goals and, uh, and allowing us to provide to us an overview of what the draft plan will look like and be like. For those of you that um, have other obligations, um, certainly feel free to sign off at this point, but Andrew and I will be here for about 15 minutes to answer questions that you may have. Again, um, we encourage you to post any questions you might have to Jack, who's identified as Q&A at Urban Systems, 
and he will ensure that we receive them. And um, we'll do our best to answer as many questions as we can. And um, thank you again for coming up this evening. Andrew, I've been doing a lot of talking. Do you want to take the first question? Sure. Okay. It looks like we have Ralph Drew with his hands up. So we can read the first question that was put into the chat. And the question says, <clears throat> Regarding the commercial land use designation, ELC sent a letter to you to consider rezoning 15 acres of land at Camp Howdy. And the question is, why has this not been acknowledged or shared? Great question. Uh, we we are aware of the the process that ELC is is undertaking. Um, the OCP is not a place to address issues related to specific properties. Uh, the commercial land use designation reflects what we've heard from the community. Um, the question about redesignating uh, the ELC lands is, is really you know, that what they're proposing is beyond what the community said was acceptable in terms of community uh, or commercial development. Um, at the in, at the current stage, there's nothing uh, in the current OCP or based on what we've heard from the, the community that, uh, that, that they could redesignate to. So it's really a larger question. Um, in our conversations with Metro Vancouver Parks and uh, other stakeholders, we've also, uh, you know, other, other things that go into that are the access uh, and emergency response uh, issues related to that property. So, you know, at this time, it's not reflected in the OCP because there's access issues that are beyond the scope of this exercise that need to be resolved before that can make it into this document, as well as the, the emergency response uh, components to that. So I hope that's, hope that's a satisfactory answer. If uh, there's more questions, uh, maybe you can direct those to staff. Well, here's another question maybe for you, Andrew. Uh, one of the our participants has noted that they think that the commercial should be pushed. And the question is, are we touching on quarter acre lots or larger lots? The commercial designation is available to basically any property um, through the through the redesignation process or the amendment process that a property owner would have to go through to get that designation applied. Those questions would come up. Uh, in, you know, that would be you know what type of business is it? What are the uh, the servicing requirements, and is it feasible for that? specific property. So those questions would be addressed at the time of the OCP amendment. Wonderful. Um, Andrew, another question. I'm just going to put you on the spot. Um, regarding the OCP framework that has been presented, what are the areas that are newly mandated by the province? Newly mandated by the province. So this was a question that was posed by Ralph Drew. Ralph, do you want to elaborate on your question? We'll need to unmute your microphone. Yes, thank you, Melissa. Uh, it, 
newly is a relative term. Our, our OC, last OCP was 11 years ago. But in the intervening, intervening period, the provincial government now requires a number of different areas that must be addressed uh, in the preparation of OCPs, such as the First Nations and reconciliation discussion. But there are other areas too. Um, and uh, um, it, it's important to realize that we are in developing the OCP, we are in a, at a different point in time operating with an, a, a different expectation by the provincial government. Great. No comment. Melissa, did, did you have any thoughts on, on that? Well, I mean, we, I mean, we certainly are addressing um, truth and reconciliation in the plan. Um, the provincial government requires us to address things like, uh, you know, housing need, um, hazard land, uh, resource extraction areas. Um, I'm struggling to think of anything that we haven't covered that uh, is required of us. <laughs> right. No, uh, you, you've answered the question. The, we're in an evolving environment. There's all kinds of subjects that weren't even on the radar 10 years ago. And, and now things like um, sea level rising and, and uh, uh, atmospheric rivers and things have really changed the dialogue a lot. Yes. Uh, yeah, so uh, to that point, like how that show, how those things show up in the, in the policies or like an example is the residential designation speaks directly to the, the village's housing needs report. Um, items like that, just to make sure that all the documents are aligned. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we haven't, we haven't gone through sort of, you know, the first, part of the plan, uh, which will provide a lot of, you know, community history and context information. And in that section, that part of the upfront section of the plan, there is a, um, uh, a section that speaks specifically to the housing needs report and provides a, a nice summary and then just frames where the residential policies that we're putting forward, kind of where they're coming from. In, in relation to the results of that report. Thank you. Oh, well, it looks like we've exhausted the questions that were sent in the chat. And Cy Rogers has his hand up. But yeah, I see that we do have a hand up. So now we'll move to, uh, to Cy. There, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. Ah, thank, you. thank you, Ralph. A <laughs> um, couple, uh, couple of points and questions. I'm very concerned that you're talking about sending this draft proposal off to the neighboring municipalities and First Nations as early as next week. Um, if, if you haven't received information back yet from First Nations, then why are we being in such a rush to, to finish this up? And the reason I ask that question is that, that uh, here in Ferro Cove, we thought that, that eventually somebody would come and, and, and look at this uh, area out here and say, you know, is there anything that we can do in Ferro Cove that might help you guys out there? Um, and we do have some ideas. I mean, we thought that perhaps at some point we would be able to put a, a letter forward and or even better, sit down and discuss it with the OCP committee. I mean, I, I'm, I'm just so concerned. We sat here for what, close to two hours now. I keep hearing, you know, Andrew, you know, saying, well, we hear this and we hear that. I don't know when you've been hearing this and I don't know who you're hearing it from. You know, I figure it looks like there's maybe 20 people on here tonight. Anyway, the question that I asked is, or, or, or should ask, because I am going on, I apologize, um, is, uh, is this set in stone? Why are we in such a rush to, to have this thing wrapped up by next Wednesday? Thank you. Right. So we have been um, posting 
interesting information about the planning process uh, around the community since January. And we have provided opportunities for the public to weigh in on the plan. Um, so if you recall, we did have a community survey that went out earlier this year where we had um, you know, over 100, I think it was 20% of the population completed the survey. So we did receive feedback that way. We also had a very well attended open house earlier uh, this spring as well, where we received I... feedback. Um, part of the reason we, well, there are a couple of reasons why we're aiming to get the draft out next week. One is that, um, you know, we were tasked with completing an OCP for community by the end of July. And but why? So that but was, why? That was a uh, council mandate. So they were the one that established the time frame. So we've been working with that time frame since we were hired. Um, the second reason is that we've heard from Slay with Tooth that they have a very formal referral process mm -hmm. and that they receive over 700 referrals a year. Mm -hmm. And so what we need to do is we need to submit the draft plan to get the conversation going. So we can submit the um, referral application with the draft plan, and that will then start a number of things on the other end that will engage Play With Tooth cultural group, where we can then start meeting with them to hear and record their story of the history of Belterra, uh, start communicating with them about you know, areas that are of interest to them, places that are significant to them. Um, but that doesn't start until we submit the referral application. So are, so are you suggesting, maybe I'm getting this wrong then, I, when I see the term draft plan, and it, 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 it's not a final plan, it's a draft to be sent out, community is gonna look at it, discuss it, have, uh, the, I sat on the last OCP and we had three three um, full houses of, of people that, uh, you know, in the village hall. And I, I, I don't quite understand. So, so is this the final, then that's it? There's nothing else after next Wednesday? So how, if somebody wanted to try and make changes, is next Wednesday the deadline? Is, is that how I understand this? So what we're providing is an opportunity to provide feedback on what we've identified as sort of the, the um, policy areas that were most top of mind for residents. So you'll look at those when you look at the community feedback form. Um, no, no, I, I, I understand. That isn't the question I'm asking you. I'm asking you, is, is next week the final day? Nothing can change after that once you send this off. Is that the case or not? Well, next week, next week is when we submit the draft plan to others to review. So we anticipate that there will be quite a number of revisions that will be made oh, okay. after we receive oh, okay. feedback from the public, from the review committee, from um, you know the dozen or so agencies that we're required to for the plan to for review under the local government act. So right. yeah, so there will be, you know, we'll get the draft out, we receive everyone's feedback. We make amendments to the plan. So I'm specific. Uh, I, I'm specifically asking about residents of Belcara, though. We can still the vet residents of Belcara can still discuss trying to make changes. Correct? Is that correct? Members of the public are welcome to provide feedback to um, the OCP review committee members to yep. administration at any point in the planning process. Okay. Yeah, you're not. So the planning process will not be over next Wednesday. No, no, no. just good. a draft plan that's, will be presented. Okay. Yeah. That's good. Okay, that, that, that's very good to know. And the best way, is there any way that uh, if a specific area or group had uh, some issues that they would felt hadn't been addressed yet, would, would they be able to uh, meet with the, the, the um, OCP committee? Um, perhaps I'll defer to Ian Devlin as the chair of the committee to address that question. Yeah, thank you. Ian, are you there? 
Yeah, I've just been sitting with my feet up. Thanks very much for waking me here. <laughs> <laughs> so Ian, the question that I asked is, uh, uh, would it be possible for a, if there's a group of out re residents that are, you know, look, looking for some minor changes um, and that felt that it hadn't really been discussed and explained to the full OCP committee, would it be possible for uh, those people to speak to the OCP committee uh, um, in, in, a, in a meeting? P perhaps next week, you guys are meeting on Wednesday, perhaps before the meeting or after the meeting or 10 minutes in the meeting, something like that? Is that, is that would that be possible? Well, it would be possible, but at, at the same time, we've got the presentations to give next week. And then okay. I believe we're also gonna get the draft document presented to us for the first time. So then we've got two weeks to review that uh, draft document and we've got a meeting scheduled, what is it, the 18th, I think, is it? No, sorry, June. My, my understanding the is that that draft, that, so my understanding fifth, Ian, is that draft document goes out on the 3rd next week. No, no, it's still a draft. If you, if okay. you, uh, All right. you'll have a chance to look at it as well. And already you're prejudging that uh, there's something missing out of it. Um, I think. Uh, well, I just I, I just sat here for close to two hours listening to the uh, listening yeah. to the comments and Andrew, you know, suggested that under residential, there was virtually no changes. So that's well, kind of telling know. me something, you know, maybe he's hinting. Perhaps there are big changes in that residential section. Well, that's not know. what my working group is saying. So there's, oh, okay. and, and that's to be yet presented to Andrew and to Melissa. So I think the, the thing is, if you want to uh, present to the committee, then I yep. think that's that should be considered for that June, middle of June. The, okay, uh, okay, that, that, that's great, Ian. Yes, Super. I, I, something at that point. Okay. I really don't know how this is going to come together in this short time frame. I think we're all concerned about it, but we're we're going I'm very along with the plan right now. I'm so very we'll concerned. See how I don't. It goes. I don't see why there's such a rush. I really, I really don't. I sat on that committee with you, and you know, several of the other guys are there right now, and I, you know, we were much enough. more open. We were much more open with everybody on what, what was going to happen. Anyway, I appreciate the answer. And uh, perhaps, and Ralph also, thank you, had suggested that we, you know, put a written submission in. Um, anyway, we'll, we'll probably do that. And uh, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Okay. As I also remember to you that the plan will go through a formal adoption process through council where there will be opportunities to make delegations to council as well. Thank you. I understand that, but usually council, once it comes to them, they're not, they don't usually like to make changes that a, a sizable committee has spent some time on, but, but thank you. I appreciate that comment. I see there's a hand, uh, is it Linda? You have your hand up. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Excellent. Uh, Linda Spence, I'm also in Fair Cove. And I also feel, as Cy does, that uh, there's a little bit of a push and a rush here. And some of us have, uh, you know, things that we would like to consider and be able to present. And some of them are fairly complicated. Um, um, I'm just wondering, I, I hear housing is, you know, brought out there as, as sort of a major priority. And I don't know how much discussion has been around that as to how housing is going to be increased when, as far as I know, the village itself is pretty much used all their land. Um, in the last open house that I was involved in, there was a lot of talk about people wanting to age in place in Belcara. And I'm just wondering if there's been any discussion around that. Uh, is, 
are there thoughts on on how people are going to be aged to be able to age in in place and with Ferro Cove being a third of the landmass of Belcara, I just don't think that there's been enough, you know, talk about land usage and land de designations and how that's going to play out in a vision. And I'm not really talking about initially. My understanding was an OPC was a vision going ahead, and I'm I'm not really convinced that there's been enough discussion about that. Um, so thank you for listening. That was just my point. Thank you very much for your comments. Kathy, I see your hand is up. Hi, Melissa. I, yes, I put my hand up. Um, this is a follow-up on Linda's comment. I actually came to Belcara to retire. And um, it's interesting. I've been talking to my neighbor. Um, I have um, my piece of property and my neighbor's property, we would be willing to put it together and um, to build, say, a retirement home. I mean, if I was to have a dream project, I would love to, say, um, consolidate four or five properties. I'm on Maine. I would be more than happy to consolidate four or five piece of property on Maine and actually sell pre-sale sell units and build a complete retirement community because this place would be so idyllic if I could make it into my 80s or my 90s to actually live here and have the services to look after me when time comes. I would be so, um, I would love to chair a project like that if there were enough people would be interested in this community. But that is such a big, um, you know, it, it, it means, it's the one thing about retirement homes is that I don't think it's like um, a condo through fair because most people, once you enter into the retirement home and there's different levels of retirement home, there's like independent living and then there's assisted living and then there's full care. I would be so delighted if the community would consider something like this. I would go through my entire street and ask if other people would be willing to come together with me with their piece of land to build a community of that nature. I know that my neighbor directly um, to the east of me is interested because then as I age, I can actually stay here and also get the services I need as I age. There's the food of thought. And, and Linda, this is like, um, you know, a, a, a thought to carry on with what you've mentioned. Thank you for uh, bringing it up. Melissa, if I may reply to that, because we're in a work, our working group is working on that very point right now. And it'll be presented at the next meeting in June. So I'm so being, excited, Ian. I'm so, so it's excited. Being, it's being considered right now, along, you know, with what you're suggesting. So that's an excellent uh, intro. Thank you very much. I would love to um, participate in a project like that. I would be willing to donate a lot of hours to go out there and put together something like this. Well, I hope to see it in the OCP. We're, we're working on it. Thank you very much, Kathleen, for, the, for your comments. Uh, it's 8.05. I know that we're about 35 minutes over. So I see we have two more hands. Let's have two more questions, and then we can adjourn for the evening. So um, I see a name, Jim Chisholm. Yep, it's Sh Sherry Chisholm. Wonderful, Sherry. Uh, am I, am I heard right now? Yeah, yeah. Oh, um, it seems to me that in the past OCPs, uh, you could go and sit in the gallery and have input. I think that there's a lot of people in the community that feel they haven't really had that opportunity. Uh, and even tonight, it's fairly controlled on the Zoom and computer stuff. 
Is it not possible to have a public meeting either at someone's home, certainly you can do it at mine, or even at the covered picnic tables in the park one afternoon so it would be an open air thing, just to let the community members, there's not that many of us, come and feel like we did have some input. I, I, I hope, Ian Devlin, that you will consider making that possible because there, there's, there's a lot of good ideas out there. And I think people would like to know that they're being heard before this draft goes forward without all the content in it. Thank you for allowing me to speak. Thank you very much. Um, perhaps Carolina Clark, um, would you like to speak to the nature of the uh, virtual meeting that we have this evening? Sure. So, okay. So right now we just opened the village hall office part. The hall has not been open yet. And the reason for that is that there's a, um, it's due to an abundance uh, of caution around COVID. Um, also, giving the limited space that we have at the hall, uh, there's quite a few people that were um, nervous on gathering on the hall. Um, so the expectation for this meeting tonight um, was that we, we would have a lot of residents attending. And because the last one, we had such great attendance, I think it was over 55 people there. Uh, that's, that, that was kind of the numbers we were expecting tonight. So um, that, that's why there was a concern on holding in the hall because uh, first is not open to the public yet. And second, um, there's limited space. But um, that's, that's the, the feedback that I can give you now. Um, from that, but uh, but yeah, but council um, will be talking about um, when we will be going back to in-person meetings, um, which I think is very important too. Thank you. Okay, um, you yeah, no problem. Thank you. So, I'm I'm uh, liking to hear the comments tonight. Uh, sorry, Melissa. I'm liking to hear the comments tonight, and I might respond to some comments that I'm hearing here. Um, at another time, I need to digest what I'm hearing tonight here. Thank you. Wonderful. So Don, I'm going to give you the last question of the evening and um, then we will adjourn. All right, uh, good evening. Uh, I just have a couple of quick points to make. Uh, I, I wanna emphasize, or I guess I throw my support behind the comment made earlier that this process seems to be extremely rushed. And after 11 years, of, of not having an OCP or a current OCP in place or since the last OCP was done, um, I, I, I think it deserves uh, the proper time uh, so we get, a, we get a, a, a proper end result. And trying to rush this thing with, with one meeting a month uh, and doing it in a six month period, I think, um, it, it, I think it's ambitious to the point of ridiculous. Um, the second comment I'd like to make is uh, uh, Sherry made it for me. Uh, In-person meetings, these, these meetings are less than ideal and they don't capture, I think the real essence of what, what people are thinking. And I think it's time we get back. Uh, the COVID restrictions have been lifted. Uh, it does allow for meetings, public meetings. And I think we should be having some public forums on this very important subject. Uh, the last uh, is a question. And that is, uh, uh, Melissa, you made a, uh, the, the next, opportunity for us to, to give you a community feedback. Uh, that was on June 2nd or 3rd. And, and if I understood, I, I may not have heard it correctly that we were only be, be given a day to give that feedback was, did I hear that right? No, so uh, right now on the village website, there is a link to a survey. So the presentation we gave tonight, along with the draft um, map that we've produced are posted on the website, along with a survey that asks you for feedback on uh, a number of policies. I believe there are over 80 policies on there, um, policy areas that were sort of identified as priorities in previous engagement that we had done with the community. And so that is live right now, and it will be available for uh, residents to complete until midnight on June, June 1st. So there's a week to provide the feedback, and then we will, um, review that material over the course of June. Yeah. Okay, thank you.
Wonderful. Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, thank you, um, Mayor and Council, for joining us this evening. Thank you, participants, for taking time out of your evening to be with us, for sharing your thoughts and your comments and concerns about the plan. I do encourage you to visit the Village website, webpage, um, have a look at the materials and get closer detail. Look at the community feedback form, which will have, you know, specific policies on there for you to engage on. And um, again, you know, um, you are, um, you know, encouraged and always available for always um, able to provide comments to us at any point in the planning process. Um, and happy to hear your thoughts and take them into consideration along with um, you know, all of the residents and stakeholders in developing the plan. So with that, I will let you get back to your evening and um, say good night. Bye everybody. Lisa, thank you very much. And all the good staff night, everybody. Urban systems. Thank <laughs> you.